Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining this morning. Um, I have today with me my dear friend and uh, our security you know, our thought leader, Nick from Snap. He he heads the detection engineering at Snap. Nick, thank you so much for joining me this, this morning. Thanks for having me so much, Sandeep. It's such a pleasure. Absolutely. So everyone, you know, this is unlike, you know, a bunch of previous webinars we have done. We will not be talking specifically about any particular product or any particular feature. Rather, the goal of this, you know, uh, session essentially is to talk to thought leaders like Nick, see how cutting edge security teams like the one in Snap or the ones in Google or Amazon essentially uh, use open source software at scale to keep their security program, keep their security apparatus consistently cutting edge. So that would be the topic today. The way we are going to go about this, Nick, essentially is of course, we have, I have a dozen, you know, almost a dozen questions for you, starting, you know, uh, talking about the evolution of cloud security, talking about how open source fits the bill, and you know, what sort of any initiatives that you might have at Slap, Snap that we could, you know, uh, take as a use case and talk about it. And of course, a bunch of inputs along the way for, vendors who have open source first uh, you know uh, go to market strategy as well as you know all, any other compliances that they need that would be the format we'll, we'll keep it uh, part structured part free flowing so please uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, anytime you want we'll take the questions towards the end so that would be the format and uh, with that i think we'll just go ahead and get started on this one so by default, all the attendees are muted. Uh, this webinar, of course, is being recorded, and you'll have the slides as well as you know uh, the video shared with you as we go forward. Uh, keep asking the questions anytime you want to. You know, ask those questions. Absolutely fine. I will try to keep looking at the you know uh, the questions, and you know if I find any question that is sort of super relevant at that point in time, I'll bring it up right now. Otherwise, we'll take up the questions uh, you know towards the end of the webinar. So with that. Uh, to introduce myself, of course, I'm, I'm Sandeep, uh, co-founder and CEO at Defense. I have Nick with me, uh, Security Engineering Leader at Snap. Nick, once again, welcome to the session. Yeah, thank you so much, Sandeep. And of course, Nick, you and me go back a long way, you know, start, you know, meeting first on the bylines of one of the, I think, conferences, and we share this common passion for open source. But for the audience, you know, that has tuned in today, do you want to go ahead, you know, sort of talk about your journey? How you, you, yeah. know, you know, what is your primary role and responsibility at Snap? What you've been doing prior to that? We would love to hear your story. Start with that, please. Yeah, absolutely, Sandeep. Thank you again for having me. It's such a pleasure to, to be here and share some thoughts with the audience. I recognize some of my friends um, and future employees that actually joined uh, this call. So we have uh, an individual joining us soon at Snap that's actually on this webinar uh, to listen in, which is, really, which is really great to see. Thank you for joining, Karen. And also awesome. thank you for joining, Jeff. Uh, look, it's been a wild journey. Um, I'm, I'm an immigrant kid who came here at five years old with two bags and a dream. My, my family landed in JFK some 20 years ago, more than that, actually like 30 years ago. And we, we've just been trying to build our life here. And I found security at a pretty young age. And at about age 16, I, start, I, I, I started hacking web proxies at school because I wanted to, to get access to the open internet to download mm -hmm. music. Um, by the way, don't do this. But at the time, the, the internet was really slow at home. We only had America Online dial up. We would get the CDs and because we were poor, we could only get like 30 hours a month from the CD and then we had to get to the, to the next CD. Yep. But the school had proper internet. It was T1, it was 1.54 Mbps, which is a lot faster. But there was a problem. I couldn't get past the web proxy to, to, to use Kazaa and Napster to download music. But I found the way, right? I figured out like, hey, there's this little host file you can edit. And if you edit the host file, it changes the route that that, that machine takes to bypass the web proxy and then I can get to the open internet. And I did, but that was my realization at about age 16, I realized that this, this security industry is my calling. And since then I've been at it for 20 years. And in the past like five years or so, something changed in my career. I realized I've learned a lot and I've harvested a lot of knowledge. And now it's time to give back that knowledge. And part of giving back that knowledge is sharing some of the cool stuff I've learned along the way with others. And that inspired me to not only do more things at Snap and be more influential, but also have a more influential effect on the community to start paying it forward. 
Uh, during COVID, during lockdowns, we had more time on our hands. I decided to create a class on cloud native, cloud security uh, technologies, fully focused on open source. That class has now been consumed by over 2,000 students. 2,000 people I've never met have, have taken a class that I created. I hope I've created some value for them. Some of them have reached out to me and thanked me. Many haven't, but that's okay. And, you know, as, yeah. and as, I, as I was writing this class, I realized that there's not a lot of good books on cloud native open source security. I bought up every book that was even like close to that topic. I had a stack of uh, seven or eight books. And then I realized none of these books are really great. And I could probably write a better book. So after the class shipped in May of 21, uh, myself and a couple of folks at Snap, we, we proposed a, a book proposal to a publisher we had a relationship with through Michael Zalewski, who used to be our VP of security. He's kind of an influential guy in the industry. He helped us with some introductions and we got a book deal with no starch, mm -hmm. uh, which bills themselves as uh, entertainment for the geeks. So we're working on the book. We're about halfway done. It'll ship in September of, of this year. And um, hopefully maybe we could do a book signing with, uh, with, with defense, maybe at one of the conferences this summer. But yeah, that's a little yeah. bit of background. And beyond that, we're right now, back. I look after corporate I look after corporate security at, at Snap. Um, also have interest in a lot of other areas um, uh, that I've talked about with you know teaching and my, my personal research. So yeah, that's a little bit of background. Absolutely love uh, love that, Nick. And you know what? We'd love to host you at our booth at RSA and maybe even at Black Hat. You know, hope, hope the book comes out by the back, uh, you know, by then. Um, and you know what? I think one of the common themes that both of us have sort of interacted on is, you know. Security is a digital public good. Everybody has a, ba it's a basic right. Everybody needs it. It's like GPS, it's like road infrastructure and security is essentially that. It's a public good. Everybody has to have an access. And I think that's where, you know, we connected on the open source, essentially the, the passion for open source and, you know, really giving it back to the community. So thank you so much for that. What I'll do is now let's just, you know, try and, you know, look at open source insecurity and how leaders such as yourself, companies such as Snap, essentially look at this from a strategy point of view, really, right? Um, yeah. At what level open source security solutions are considered by your teams, be it the detection engineering team, be it the, the, the security engineering team, or DevSecOps, or you know, you name it, essentially. Is it is right. it one of the options that comes to you know uh, the team's mind, or you essentially always start with open source solution? Is how do you really think about it? We almost always start with open source and the reason from there. Now, there are some things they wouldn't build, like they wouldn't build an antivirus team and that's really involved and other people have done it really well. Uh, we, we probably wouldn't build some other commodity tools, but would we build a service around device trust to assure that every single corporate device on the network actually belongs to the company? And when you authenticate to a company endpoint, we can mm -hmm. add in a payload in, in the authentication header to assure that, that that endpoint is actually the company's endpoint and it's not a rogue endpoint. That's something we build. We call it device trust. So it's foundational, right? We could have went and bought something similar. Sure, there's Beyond Corp uh, style zero trust products in the industry, but that, that's not how we approach them. Let me, let me tell you a little bit more about why. Yeah. Uh, let me zoom back out to the kind of cloud cloud angle here. To me, it's really ironic that the cloud and the internet are built on open source technologies broadly. However, most security tools are closed source commercial products. Uh, this has a bunch of downsides that I, that I wanna talk about. Uh, a, I think it holds back security engineering as really being seen as a true engineering discipline in a lot of companies. Uh, at high technical bar companies, this isn't the case, but in, in lower technical bar companies, security is seen as a compliance function, as the policy people, people who say no, well, why, why is that the case? At, like, at the foundation, security is an engineering problem, right? And so at, you know, at internet scale, the way that we operate, we, we need to build to support the, the ecosystem that we're part of. If I can't convince an engineering team that a security control needs to be implemented and built in a certain way, and we can't have like low level observability of, of how we do that, especially in the cloud context, we're not gonna be able to get it across the line. And closed source commercial products, uh, you're, you're basically living to the vendor documentation and mental models. Uh, let me give you an example. Snap runs a service mesh with over a thousand Kubernetes clusters. 
In order to add runtime monitoring like Falco, we, we had to convince the mesh platform engineering team, that's kind of the central team that builds the service mesh, that we instantly understand the fault modes for Falco. And we have a way to kill the sidecar that Falco runs in if something goes wrong. I remember this meeting vividly. It was a meeting with the engineering director for that team. He's like, Nick, where is the big red button? I'm like, yeah. oh, you mean like, how do I kill it if it's, if, it's, if it's doing something unexpected? Yeah, like Nick, how do you kill it? Because yeah. honestly, these folks don't really want this there. This is like another uh, variable for them to manage. So we have to convince them that this is the right thing to do. So how do we do it? Well, we throw model it. And we sit down and say, and say, okay, what are the fault modes that can happen? The cluster loses connectivity to the network and fully saturates the network adapter. What do we do next? Falco uh, sidekick service is down or inaccessible. How do we kill it? Do we push a bad rule to Falco? Now the rule updater is stuck in a, in a loop, right? Yeah. What do we do next? Or we have an unexpected CPU load on the kernel and that that's maybe the fault of Falco. How do we have observability? So we spent like a year studying how to do this correctly. I'm not kidding, like a year. And then implementing all of these control mechanisms, these big red buttons, as I call them, right, uh, mm -hmm. to, to roll out Falco. That's just one, like, one major product. Yeah, we chose open source Falco instead of Sysdig, uh, like enterprise Falco. Why? Because we felt we could do it ourselves, and we wanted to take the time to really do it correctly and, and not put ourselves into a position where that, when I get, you know, challenged by an engineering director, uh, where's the big red button? I know where the button is. And I know how it operates. And I'm confident that we need to, when we need to press it, we, we will press it if we need to. So that's part of our ethos. And I think when you build security services in-house completely or open source, you know exactly what's going on. You can debug traces with have low-level observability. You are empowered to scale the services to your company's needs. You're not locked into a vendor ecosystem. And ultimately, this is a lot more fun. Like, I think I can hire better people who are more into building and then keep them happy because they're building really cool stuff in the industry that's novel. You know, versus like taking boxes on a UI, you don't really even know what the box does. You have to dig in through a vendor documentation. Now, I do want to caveat, this isn't for everybody. A lot of companies may not want to treat their security engineering program this, this way, but where they have a, a heavy build or a heavy open source culture. Some companies want to treat it more as like a dial or manage a Rolodex of vendors. Yeah. Run some tools, you know, look at some logs, have some alerts, you know, do some follow-up. At the end of the day, this is risk management. Like they can choose to manage the risk that way. We've chosen, the, we've chosen to manage the risk a very different way, a very intentional way, a very deep way, a very methodical way. And to do that, we have to really understand what's going on. And to do that, we need to have low-level understanding of the code, of the, of the, the providence of it, if it comes from open source, which of course we can always look because open source is open, or yeah. build it in-house. So that, that's a little bit of our ethos, Sandeep. Uh, absolutely, I couldn't agree more with you. In fact, as you were outlining that particular example, I totally concur that operationalizing security program at scale is an engineering problem. It is not a vendor problem. It's not any of those other things, really. And especially at your scale or any you know internet scale companies, it's it's the the tool, the product that you're using has to be out there in the public. You should be able to look at the source code build faith around the you know the thesis the product has you know maybe even sort of evaluate it internally to see if it is you know it's it meets your your own standards of quality really right um and the second one exactly. is scale most of the closed source product and i totally agree with you they probably wouldn't scale to where snap is at or where google is at for sure really right so you can take the code from open source customize it you know operationalize it Truly, the way engineering happens in you know top tier tech companies really. So, I couldn't agree with you more really. And you know, I think the right way to put it is 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 basically that operationalizing security is an engineering problem, right? It's not a compliance. Uh, 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 absolutely, it's it, it is risk management again at the end of the day. But to operationalize and scale it, you need to create these happy paths for engineering teams, right? You need to make it easy for them to do the right thing and hard for them to do the wrong thing. Yeah, in a totally. way that's as frictionless and seamless as possible. Yeah, absolutely, couldn't agree more. And you know what? What I love uh, that the fact about open source, like you know, you mentioned that essentially is the quality of folks that you can hire just to work on cool stuff, which is out there and open. And trust me, since we went open source, I have made most of my key hires on GitHub. It changes the game. You are not no longer <laughs> right. doing the initial recruitment. You're really, yeah. really going and hiring top talent, for example, eBPF, you know, we did the same thing. Most yeah. of my top eBPF hires are from GitHub projects. Either they reach out or we reach out and that's it. No recruiters, nothing. So open source essentially yeah. 
And the ethos, the quality, the DNA essentially has to be needed in DNA to operationalize any kind of security at scale. So yeah, absolutely. Now, we, we spoke about, we, you know, I want to go deeper on one or two use cases, uh, you know, that you might be dealing with or the team might be dealing with at Snapnik. But you know, you have had quite a journey. I know you you were personally hired at SpaceX by Elon, and you know, you worked with a bunch of bunch of blue chip uh, tech companies before that. What is your mental model? You know, having been through the journey, really, it has evolved. I'm sure, really, right, based on starting as a 16 year old hacker yeah. to where you are now. What is your <laughs> definition? Of what is good and what is great? What is just compliance driven purchase, and what is Security engineering yeah. driven, you know, you know, security program essentially. Yeah, you know, having a chance to work with Elon and doing some consulting work, 2011, 2013 timeframe, I, I, I opened my eyes to what I call good to great security. And I think the major difference between good to great is the engineering bar and the adoption of a either an in-house build culture or an open source build culture. Like, like, like we already mentioned, so at its core, security is an engineering problem. So let's talk about an example. Let's say you have 2,500 engineers that need to correctly manage IAM permissions for AWS, right? And we need to do this consistently. So how do you make this easier for 2,500 engineers? Do you let them like pick whichever permission they want? Do you like have some set of permissions? Do you have some birthright access? Do you have, do you have like some kind of system you build? How do you do that? Like. How do you abstract away the complexity of 20, of 2,500 engineers, right? You need to build a happy path, right? And sure, there's vendor solutions that do this, but in this example, Snap has also chosen to build in-house. We built a tool in-house to do this. And we've taken a, like a, a leasing philosophy where you get access for the, an ephemeral period of time, and that, that, that ephemeral period of time then expires. And like our app, where you send a Snap, once you've read it and replayed it once, it's gone forever, ever, ever. Yeah. Right, yeah. same thing. Same thing with the access. Now, the balance here is how much overhead does this create for an engineer, engineer to come in, request access, lose access, request access, lose access. We're not clobbering them like every couple of hours. You know, it's every couple of days or maybe a little bit longer. But that's the kind of thing that you need to do. Like we've solved for this at massive scale. Not even one cloud, two clouds, and that internal system that we build it handles both both of them. And we could probably scale it to a third one if, if we needed to. So I think when you consume vendor services, it's kind of like being a hoarder. Like that, that's my like mental model. You know, that these, these shows about like people who have like hoarding problems and they hoard all this stuff. They have like rent um, storage units to hoard stuff. And then like something happens in their life and they need to sell all of it. To yeah. me, buying a bunch of vendor tools like being a hoarder. At one point you're gonna be like, what am I even doing? Like I'm lost in the, these tools that I have. I don't even know what they're for. Like a lot of tools are never even used. There's about, there was like a study on this recently I read on the internet that I think like 40% of organizations have tools that they never even log into, right? Yeah. They're like, what's the exactly. point? So you got to be like a lot more intentional about this stuff, right? Because if you're being intentional in building, you know why you're building, you know why you're there, you know why the code's being written, and you know why the open source is being used. When you're like consuming tools left and right, and unfortunately the industry wants us to do that. I get solicited to probably 50 times a week. You know, it's everything from like, you know, Nick, do you want a gift card? Do you, or do you want to go drive Porsches with us so I get to know you a little bit better? Like, come on. Like, why do we have to be, you know, having this like transactional, too? right? Are you getting <laughs> AirPods? AirPods too? Like, I can't <laughs> yeah. accept any of these things. It's against company policy. Please don't offer me. So anyway, I think the time for open source really is, is now. The security landscape is shifting to open source first. And these recessionary times when companies are being challenged and CFOs are being more scrutinizing with those that Rolodex of vendors that I talked about, the time yeah. for open source is right now. Like the CFO doesn't care how, how much open source costs because it doesn't cost anything to get started. And then when you graduate and you want enterprise, it's probably going to be more affordable than a pure pure play commercial product. What do you think, Sandy? Well, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Especially in fact, I had I had a couple of questions that came up. You know, from from this discussion that we're having. The first question, Nick, is to run security engineering, security as an engineering function in a way really, or I'll call it security engineering, which is basically operationalizing security apparatus at scale. Roughly what sort of commitment companies like Snap look at essentially, are we looking at 10 security engineers for every hundred, uh, you know? Yeah, is yeah that that's, sort of that's, a really good, that's a really good That's a really good question. Yeah, that's that's right. So we, 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 we've we historically taken a 10% of engineering um, kind of baseline proxy metric. 
So if engineering is 2,500 or so, about 10% is security engineering across all different disciplines, right? We have seven teams across those 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 disciplines. But yeah, that that's the metric. That's a big investment. A lot of companies cannot make that kind of investment. And if you're a smaller company and you're listening to this, so like, man, this guy's crazy. Like, how can you have that many people? Well, because we're intentional, we care a lot, and we build. If you're smaller, you can scale that down to the smaller size that that, that you are, right? Maybe it's not 10% for you, maybe it's 5%, right? But it, it, it needs to be a kind of like engineering minded metric. Otherwise it's unclear what, what the purpose of this role is. Yeah. And that is so true for so many products. It's unclear why they were purchased, why, what are the, you know, what are the matrix, what are the key goals and objectives you had, they never get deployed. Forget getting deployed at scale, they just never even get deployed really, really. Find solutions really. And you know, I completely agree with you that, um, you know, open source gets, you know, forget the vendor side of it, purely from a customer's point of view, from a user's point of view, it, you know, you have some of the greatest pieces of technology out there. You can modify it, you can look at it, you can smell it, you see it fits the bill or not, and then go from there. And then of course, oftentimes you see that there are companies, there are startups who are essentially offering support or some additional features on top of that, that you can always reach out to, you know, you know, work with them as part of your, you know, your extension as a, you know, as a part of your team, essentially, and then go, go from there really, right? So do you do that as well, Nick, or it's primarily, you know- No, we, 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 we collaborate. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example, but we needed to build um, ARM64 support for, for Falco. Uh, what did we do? We went on the Falco Slack forums and started talking to other people who are eBPF developers. We're not eBPF developers. The person who worked on this and part of our sister team, like, he never even looked at that before, but we, you know, again, we have a higher technical bar. We, yeah. we give people space and it took some time, but he figured it out. And now we have ARM64 support. What would we have done if it was a vendor? All right, um, hello, Mr. Account Manager. Um, hi, I'm Nick, I have a problem. Um, we, we, this, this thing doesn't have ARM64 support. Can you get it into the roadmap? Oh, okay, Nick, uh, let me go talk to the product manager. Okay, okay, okay. Some time passes, they come back. Oh, let me talk to the product manager's manager. Um, you know, Nick, we talked to the head of product that mm, we can't build this for you. It's going to be six quarters. What? That like that's the reality that we deal with. Like that that that's that that really is the reality. I'm not being dramatic. So, yeah, and I think it also depends on how enterprise grade that that particular open source product is. I mean, is it just a command line tool that you're bringing in and then building yeah. a around it or it that, that, that's you know, that's yeah. that's exact that's exactly right like 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 defense and falco these are enterprise grade security tools much like what hashicorp brought to the market when they built vault some 10 years ago right like it's enterprise grade it's high quality for the enterprise and happens to be open source this is like the best of the world right like why is it, why are more people doing this i don't get it i don't get it so why isn't everyone doing it? Absolutely. I think everybody is, 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 is going to do it uh, soon enough. Absolutely agree with you. So, um, Nick, you know, moving on, I, I have, I'm already getting a couple of questions, more than a couple of questions from audience, which, which I'll just <laughs> we did, uh, the, the last point was super important for them. And I, I totally see, you know, how and why essentially, uh, hey, do I have to put in 10% of my engineering strength to operationalize this particular tool now? Or will 2% do? Or will 1% do? Or, hey, you know what? I'm an up and coming SMB. Uh, we just hired our first security hire, and that's my whole team. What do I do with open source? Yeah. Right? I'm sure these are all yeah. uh, you know, valid questions, and I would have sort of dig deeper into you know, all of these. So, but moving on, you know, uh, for now, tell us what are some of the challenges organizations may face when trying to adopt OSS for security. And what I mean by this is, is there, do you, for example, you, in, in particular your case really, do you have a checklist that, hey, this project has to be Apache V2, hey, this has to be part of CNCF or OpenSSF, or you know what, the pen test report has to be out there on GitHub, otherwise I'm not going to touch it, you know? Is yeah. there a mental yeah. model, is there a checklist, you know, that you or the team had essentially while evaluating such projects for your internal usage? Yeah, that, that, that's a great, really good question. Well, I look, I, I think to, to get started, like the technical bar is definitely a bit higher and you need to hire people who, who are technically capable, hands-on engineers. Not all security engineers can code. For open source, I think you need people who can code or it could be DevOps engineers or other engineers, but they need to be engineers. Like they need engineering to be somewhere close to the title. 
Uh, that, that, that's one of the challenges. You need to have that type, type of talent. Now, I think secondly is, is you need to ensure the project you're, you're considering is, is legitimate and it's serious. And you should also consider supply chain tampering, like maybe projects coming out of certain parts of the world, maybe they have, maybe they have back doors, maybe they have some, some nefarious things going on, maybe they're uh, sort of, uh, you know, Trojan horse kind of projects to get into your environment and then observe your environment. So you got to be cautious with open source as well. So the way we look at it is like, is it legitimate? How much adoption has it had in the industry? Are people in our like tighter circles of security engineers talking about it? How many stars does it have on GitHub? How many times has a repo been forked, right? Like how, 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 uh, how good of quality is the code? Like we can obviously audit the code because it's open source, right? And then how much more do we need to do to make it um, operationalized at our company? Because that, that's the part that takes the time, right? Like you, yeah. you, you can't always drop it in and, and, and get immediate results. It depends on your requirements. Like if our requirements are very sophisticated, if you're a smaller company, it may not be as sophisticated. So uh, pen test reports also matter, but I think reputation matters more and like, like really like shaking it down and like getting a couple of people to look at it closely, that, that can yeah. probably give you enough, um, and, enough comfort. And, and, and the, really the rest is, is, is implementation and oper operationalization. No, totally agree. And in fact, you know, the, the, the bit that you said about um, uh, are there any backdoors? Is there anything potentially nefarious with this? I think open source sort of, you know, gives you, puts it out there in open really for so many eyeballs, you know, like you, you essentially so many people are looking at it at the same time. And, you know, if you look at, if you look at the stories, every quarter, somebody's firewall gets hacked. The, you know, the genesis of security industry was around hacking closed source products really, right? So open source in a way, yeah. I think I'm sure a uh, fresh breath of air because, you know, it's out there to see, you can have your engineers, you know, look at it, pen test it, you know, file yeah. tickets, treat this as an engineering problem, just like you would do for your services, you know, your critical, yeah. um, you know. I can think I, of many vendor security incidents that we responded to as a result of poor security practices. Yeah, totally, yeah, totally see that, yeah. In fact, you know what? I wanted to keep this question for the end, uh, Nick, but I think it's so relevant to this particular point. I must uh, bring it up now. This is a question from Sachit. Sachit is the question for you, Nick. He's basically asking, uh, I can't do 10% uh, uh, secondary engineering from get-go for open source. If new adopters are scaling an OSS program, what are core competencies needed in secondary engineering? Mm -hmm. Essentially, what Sachit is yeah. asking is, Hey, I have an X people engineering team and I have some security folks. Yeah. What do I look for in these security engineers to be, you know, calling them essentially security engineers for this new program, really, right? Such a time as gotcha. that uh, is the, the, you know, the, the essence of your question. Nick, over to you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Sachit, thanks for joining. Sachit is a friend of mine for many years, actually. So great question. Look, you don't need 10% to get started. 10% is where you, where you may end up well, over time. I, I think you need a couple of good people who have done similar work in, in and around open source projects, either developers of them, contributors to them, or at other companies that have similar cultures. Like take any tier one, tier two tech company. Most of those companies have done open source projects in, in this kind of way. And then you decide, okay, where do I put their focus? And what are some OKRs for that focus? Right, you know, for us, it was for the Falco story. It was getting runtime observability over our uh, over our Kubernetes fleet. That was a big, big, big project. Right, it took it took a while to do that. That that was our challenge. But our fleet is like very large and complex. Maybe in your area, it's not as complex and 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 large. And so, pick like one or two areas where you feel like there's good partners on the market, like like Defense, for example, that have built legitimately high quality enterprise grade products. Find one or two people, probably at like a L four L five level. Um, uh, which is like senior, senior or, or staff, and and put their focus on this. And if they're good and, and the product that you're using is good, I think you're going to see incredible results. You'll be surprised by how much how much your value you're getting and how much money you're you're saving with open source. Yeah. Absolutely, Nick. Absolutely agree. And then you know, like you said, it, it it has a lot to do with whether the project that you are picking up comes back to include it. You know, is there a company behind it? Is there, is there, you know, essentially someone who's sort of willing to work as an extension of your team, even if you don't have a team, for example, you're just building up right. a program. 
I mean, is there is there a community like if, if if it's two guys in a van kind of open source project? Like, yeah, maybe it's kind of risky to put your your big bet behind that. But if it's a legitimate company that has large adoption, like the examples that we've talked about, they have a product community, they have good quality documentation. Like, that's okay. Like, you 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 could start there and then and then iterate and 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 see and, and see how your adoption goes. Yeah, absolutely. Nick. In, in fact, you know what, there is one more question uh, coming from Christian Becker. What Christian is essentially asking is, what about OSS license management? Thinking about copyleft and copyright licenses here in commercial use. Yeah, that's that's a great question, Christian. So yes, you need a way to to observe this. Um, there are mechanisms and tools that can can ensure you're within license, license uh, compliance. Uh, basically, there's tools that scan repos to look for whether the uh, license allows uh, commercial usage or, or for commercial usage, rather. Uh, this is another angle of it. Yes, the, you do need to manage this. It's not uh, something you can exclude. But you can also very clearly, when you go to the project like Defense, you can see what the license is. And before you adopt it, you can say, okay, can I use this license? Is this an this license allow this kind of use case. Uh, open source cannot be the wild, wild west. You can't be like, okay, team, open source, slam my hand on the table, scatter. No, you, you like anything in life, you need to have a strategy, you need to be intentional. And so when you pick like one or two or, you know, or five of these, you, you can vet them obviously, and you should vet them before you use them. And then I think you'll have a much, much better understanding of, of what you're doing. And the, these types of risks are, 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 are really, really mitigated. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, Christian, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Nick. And, and moving on for now to, you know, essentially a more specific use case for you, right? I want to ensure, Nick, that, you know, we're giving um, our, our listeners right now something super concrete that they can relate to, for example, you know, hey, I'm just building out my security program and I've been told by my CISO, or uh, it's a board level, you know, sort of, a you know, uh, a director which has come in, which says, hey, you have to be at least 50% compliant as per MITRE TAP. And that, in, that mm -hmm. means doing one, two, three, and four, right? That could be basically vulnerability management. There has to be, you know, uh, cloud specific attack vectors, you know, as per cloud uh, MITRE attack uh, framework, really, right? MITRE attack, of course, is, you know, it has so many flavors now for cloud, Kubernetes, and so much more. How would you go about it? Essentially, and it, it's a very, uh, sort of a high level question, essentially, we can just pick up one single modality saying that, hey, look, um, we are working on AWS, forget Kubernetes for a moment, really, just think of it mm -hmm. as AWS cloud environment. And I am supposed to be meeting at least 50% of the MITRE guidelines. And in doing so, you know, does two or three things for me, makes me compliant, gives me peace of mind, because I have covered almost 50% of, you know, uh, uh, the needed most essential bits, really. And you know mm -hmm. stuff like that. Essentially, can we map some of the open source tools that we have that that you might have seen to one of the existing, one of the ongoing, or one of the evolving programs within Snap, saying that hey, look, um, we would we were supposed to be doing this. Let's say MITRE attack. We were supposed to have fifty percent coverage for MITRE, and as part of that effort, this is what we did, and this is how we went about it. Yeah. Do you have any such case study that you you think we can share? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really that's a really good question. Uh, the way the way I would think about this is as follows: uh, MITRE is now pivoted and, and provided very actionable, very measurable, uh, from initial infection to pivot to lateral movement uh, coverage with their uh, ATT and CK framework. Right, so you can sit down and map this to what this means to your DNR program, for example, and say, okay, how do we get signal coverage? for 50% of the MITRE, ATT, and, and CK framework. Well, what are they? Let's look at them in detail. Now we say, okay, how do we get a signal for that uh, uh, attack vector from, an, from the AWS infrastructure? Well, we need some kind of product to do that, right? Mm -hmm. We need some kind of observability product to do that. It, it turns out that Defense offers MITRE mappings out of the box. So if you turn on defense for that cloud infrastructure to start observing it, you'll quickly see which one, wh which signals you're generating for the, for the cloud infrastructure in those AWS accounts. It could be at a VM level, it could be at a, at a uh, Kubernetes uh, EKS level, regardless, right? 
you'll get that like out of the box immediately. And then that saves you a lot of time. Like this stuff is hard. Like sitting down and like parsing spreadsheets to figure out like, well, I have this thing here, math submitter here. This is really labor intensive and not fun. But yeah. if you have this mapping in a, in a product, like it'll quickly show you like, here's the coverage here, here's the gaps here. And then you can start to operationalize those signals to your detection and response team to act on it, to triage it, right? To enhance the alert. And then we get into playbooks and response and containment kind of exercises that you know, as per classic detection and response goes. And uh, this is this is pre-deployment as well as post-deployment technically, right? Some of these controls, some of the checks and balances, some of these tools that you need to officialize to let's say meet 50% of MITRE coverage, really, they have to be deployed throughout your CICD pipeline, right? They are they're not necessarily only as part of CICD in the sense of you know, pre-deployment or not necessarily only at some time, right? They have to be scattered throughout. The first, you will have to probably figure out all the integration points, where you really need to do what, map it back to uh, potential vendors or open source projects and essentially go from there really, right? To get you that uh, broader coverage. That, that's that's exactly right. Like, And there, there's no like secret like weapon here to, to how to do this. You have to sit down and think about it. But, but coming back to my point around if the coverage comes with the product out of the box, which it does with defense, like that's so powerful that this this could take many, many, many days and weeks to to parse through. Uh, and I think that's to, to, in a sense, it's like a quick start guide already. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, moving on. I have, I'm getting a couple more questions, but I think we can uh, save those for later. They're not about the, the point that we were discussing. So let's move on um, and, you know, talk about this particular uh, question that, that is in front of us essentially is so when you think about building secure cloud native services and we're getting more specific about cloud native now are there any fundamental controls or partner technologies that are table stakes for organization to consider essentially what are the lowest common denominators make when it comes to building a cloud native security program is what the question is yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a really good question the way the way we think about it is this like the foundations that we need to build to be secure, whether it's in a corp context, in a cloud context, in other con context, those foundations really haven't changed in the last 20 years. The technologies and the how has changed, but the foundations really haven't changed. So when I the way I think about this is, okay, you start with a security strategy for those foundational controls that you need to have in, in your environment. And they could be things like, do you have observability on a, any piece of infrastructure that is being provisioned to your to a public internet presence? Do you have observability on on hardening, scanning, pre-deployment? Do you have runtime observability in context? Are you collecting logs? Are you sending them to a system or a human who can act on them? Do you have audit mechanisms to to look for changes to that infrastructure that are unexpected? If a pod is immutable, which it is. In the cloud con in the cloud Kubernetes context, if there's changes on a pod, like what's going on? Like why is somebody uh, shelling into a pod? That that's probably a bad actor behavior. Now, continuing my my discussion here. Now you, you take that signal and you send it to to an, an individual, and that individual acts on it, or a system acts on it. With SOAR type frameworks, we can have systems acting on signals now. So what what I just what I just described like that, it really hasn't changed in the last twenty years. When we had bare metal VMs and data centers, when I got started with this industry, it was basically the same. It's become more sophisticated and the scale has, has become larger and the unit of deployment has become smaller. Now it's the pod before it used to be the physical server. But the, 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 the elements of this are basically the same. Yep. Yeah, you know, I totally agree. In fact, you know what, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I used to wonder, Nick, and I'm sure you've thought about this too, is given the fact that observability basically means being able to infer internal state of any system by looking at the outgoing signals right which is why you have melt in you know observability metrics events errors logs and traces essentially really in in cyber in security we have the mitre attack and defend we have really granular flavors of mitre for for various modalities but there isn't anything like melt which basically tells me, hey, if you just take this four, you've taken care essentially. But what I what I what I learned from what you're saying, which I, I think I mean, it, it sort of you know uh, resonates very well with me, is look, there are four pillars here too. The first pillar essentially is 
measure your attack surface. You know, that is your pre-deployment checks, post-deployment checks, scanning, CSPM, what have you, really. Essentially, mm -hmm. what could go wrong? Pillar number one. And this is commodity. Everybody needs it. Uh, the modality change, it was VMs earlier, now it's Kubernetes on top of VMs, probably tomorrow something else. But essentially, the, the core principles remain same. The modality might change. So measure what could go wrong, number one. And then deploy or develop a way essentially to measure what comes in, what goes out, and what changes is basically what it is really. Figure out your attack surface and see how the runtime signals are interacting with your attack surface. And that is pretty much it. Uh, My essentially uh, is a way to uh, see the same, right? Would, would you agree? Yeah. I know, I, I completely agree. And so we, we could talk more specifically about this. We have some, some questions up, um, and it's sort of in the back. Maybe we could skip to question nine. I, I can talk more about this. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Now this is this is purely this question comes purely from a startup's point of view, uh, Nick really, right? Like, like I'm a startup. Let's say we're running a startup, which is you know having this open source project, seeing great traction, and uh, we want to know how a top tech, you know, top tier engineering team would evaluate such a such a such a project, really, right? Uh, yeah. The first part is of course reputation and even the fitment and you know all of that, sure. But is there anything more there? Uh, absolutely. So first of all, first of all, the first question is what what problem are we looking to solve internally? Yeah. And sometimes we do a build versus buy bake off if there's a compelling product in the industry that we're, we're we can get behind. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we 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 skip immediately to open source or or build. And I kind of look at those in the same modality because the open source all, almost always involves like some some building to operationalize into your environment. So. And then we ask ourselves like, okay, what is like the ideal state? And this is where like my product management hat turns on a little bit. Uh, there's this idea of like working backwards like, okay, now that the thing has been completed and launched and it has this capability, you, you will have like an announcement of that a capability. I'll give you an example. Now we can observe all runtime uh, for Kubernetes based clusters at this company with Falco. Perfect. How do we work backwards from that end state to actually establish that. And then how do we evaluate the potential partners with how close they will get us to the what and why that we're looking to accomplish with objective criteria? Like how legitimate are they in the market? How, how much existing adoption do they have? How, how many uh, feature requests or pull requests are being submitted into their open source project? How engaging is their, uh, is their support community? Like, we we don't want to be on an on an island ultimately. If we have to support something, we'll, we'll we'll we will usually figure it out. But those are the kind of questions that we ask, right? Now, beyond beyond that, um, we we also ask ourselves how how long will this probably exist, and like what's the next iteration of it? And with open source, the next iteration can be our own iteration. We can fork the project and make it to whatever we want. Versus with closed source partner technologies that are completely commercialized, we're at the mercy of the product team, back to my you know, begging and pleading to, to the product management team to build features. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think in, uh, after that, of course, the open source product or the project that you're choosing has to be at least as good as the closed source options that might be there on the table essentially, or at least has to be open enough so that it, you can customize it really, right? And that's when the quality differences will probably start coming in. Hey, what is the quality of alerts or how many integrations it has and stuff like that really, right? So right. the more quality Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, Nick, moving on to the next question. And I, I told you already, we have at least a dozen questions for you. And in the, I see more and more questions coming in from folks as well. So I hope you have time. But uh, we'll move on and yeah, talk about of course. this. Yeah. Of course. Absolutely. So the question is, you work with household internet scale companies. I mean, Snap is a household name. Um, and, and that, of course, makes you a desirable target for bad actors, really, right? And is there a, a use case or example of how your OS strategy helps your company manage cloud native security at internet scale, essentially? So I think this is probably the same uh, uh, use case that you're speaking about earlier, observability, Nick, but, but over to you. If there is anything more that comes to mind, yeah, yeah. Well, at, at internet scale, as we discussed, they're off, they're often are, are not uh, alternatives that are palatable that are not open source or built in house. Now, to make this to make the answer here like a little bit more useful to a broader audience, they're not always internet scale companies. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about like the tenets of, of why open source is useful. So I lead my teams to have extreme ownership and focus on craftsmanship, right? You, 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 you eat your own food, so to speak, meaning the code that you build, it should be of high quality. We should have unit tests. We should have coverage. It should be understood by others. It should not be a black box. We should avoid single points of failure, right? Which means a single, a single engineer on a team should, should not be the only person who understands it. Multiple engineers on a team need to understand it. With open source, this is very achievable because everybody can see what's happening. They can look at the repo. We can, we can collaborate on, on feature requests and PRs. We can do code reviews together, right? And we, we, know, like, we know what's happening and that, that helps us really for that helps us inform our strategy just like iterate and like you know, build feature a build feature b and so forth um in another sense i think open source helps us with hiring like i already talked about some of this but like the best people in the industry that we hire they want to build the cool stuff like they want to do stuff that's like really notable we've open sourced some projects that snap has built like back to the community right and we'll awesome. and we'll do more why why, like, why not? It's we built it. We built it for the world. We'll, we'll, we'll build. We'll, we'll allow allow the world to use it. I think also having an, an open source heavy culture, it allows you to hire software engineers into security engineer roles. Because at the core, like, what what is a security engineer? A security engineer is somebody who has context and knowledge of threat modeling and attack surface, and risk like kind of risk based mentality. But they're also somebody who can code and who's a, who's an engineer at the core. So in some cases, we've taken software engineers by title and really by background, and we've hired them into teams that, that build that build services or or build on top of open source services. And we've taught the threat modeling, the, the, the kind of attacker based mentalities and so forth. Now we open up our talent pool like dramatically if we can hire, let's say back end software engineers versus security engineers, which are a lot harder to find and, and they, they typically come at a premium. No, agree completely. Agree. Yep. Yeah. Moving on next to the next question, and uh, this is a little bit about you know the, the discussions that, that even we've been having essentially is when you think about defense or a project like defense, really, essentially a threat mapper, our open source, uh, you know, uh, CNAP essentially, which helps you scan as part of CI/CD at runtime across all of the cloud native modalities, essentially, to and ensures that all the all the day zero essential features like vulnerability management, you know, CSPM, malware scanning, secret scanning is essentially out there for everyone to use, but also comes with backers included, right? Like you have integrations, you can, you know, integrate this tool in your ops tooling, file a Jira ticket, you know, all of that stuff really. So, and this probably goes back to one of the earlier questions essentially is when you're taking something like this, like, you know, defense may have had a different journey. I mean, they, they did not start as an open source company, we were closed source first earlier, right? When we when we started, but then we went open source. So the platform that we open mm -hmm. source essentially was already being used by enterprises for for you know close to a year, really, right? Yeah. So, um, what would be your input to to startups or vendors like Defense, essentially, that hey, it's it's essential to have those enterprise features baked in as part of your platform that you're putting out, so that anybody could just download and start using it, you know, without any customization, without putting any, you know, additional resources on it. How would you look at it essentially? What would be your advice to, uh, you know, the listeners? Well, look, if if you're a, a builder, uh, like like yourself, Sandeep, and you, you would like to take a product to market and you're commercial only, you're going to be met with a lot of resistance from people like me. Uh, I get peppered for requests to look at stuff all the time. And a lot of it I'd, I'd never even look at because to me, what's more novel is what, what you're doing. What, what's more novel is taking an open source approach. So in the competitive landscape that that exists in this industry with, with just N you know, products and so many options, so much optionality, there are very few high quality open source products. And those stand out to me, the ones that do stand out to me. And this this is why I'm a, I'm an advocate for this, this space. Uh, so my advice would be like, hey, build this in to your product or like maybe you have like some part of the product open source people can start maybe there's like a freemium kind of layer of hey you start here and then you grad and when you graduate we're, we're here we're, we're here with you we're not going to leave you you'll leave you hanging right and so like in that sense you 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 can get the best of both worlds like you, you get your product to to market for people like myself who are skeptical of closed source and then you you have a you know kind of like a revenue pipeline to en enhance and 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 build the the enterprise version into that customer install over time. 
Absolutely. And, you know, overall, it, it raises the bar for everyone, really, right, uh, by permanently shifting these, you know, uh, demand and supply curves. In, in our case, in, in, in cloud security, essentially, everything that you need mm -hmm. on day two, but whether you're building out a security program or whether you have already a mature program or you're willing to, you know, or looking at replacing a bunch of closed source vendors with open source becomes a standard, essentially, really, right, in terms of usage, adoption, and, you know, that way you are, you know, slowly but steadily changing the demand and supply curves of cloud security. Couldn't agree more, yeah. yeah uh, moving, on, sure. moving on. So we spoke about observability. We spoke about uh, Falco, Falco's use case. We spoke about the four pillars that need to be defined, uh, which is basically you know, what comes in, what goes out, what changes, and how all of this interacts with your existing attack surface. Very specifically, you know, post-deployment, I know you're a large uh, sort of, you know, I think one of the largest Kubernetes deployments I've heard of, honestly, you know, I've been, you know, we've been speaking to so many large companies, but your scale is very, very different, in, especially in terms of Kubernetes, really. So tell me more about this post-deployment, how important is runtime security observability, you know, and we're talking about the molecules, we're talking about pod level context, process level context, yeah. you know, all of that, yeah. Yeah, let's let's go deep on this. So think about it this way. You you've now you've deployed. Now, now you've done all the, the work that you've done pre-deployment that we talked about previously. You've hardened the images. You mm -hmm. have ensured there's no malware. You've bootstrapped your your pods. Now you're deployed, now you're running. Okay. How mm -hmm. do you observe for bad in this running state? And in a, in a, in, a, in a immutable service context where a change should never actually happen to a pod because it's meant to not be changed. So you need, observability, you need an observability layer like Falco or like Defense that can basically run a kernel level eBPF probe to look for, look for syscalls to the kernel, introspect them and tell you, hey, is this normal or is this not normal? And if it's not normal, fire off an alert. Here's some like really good examples. A lot of Kubernetes clusters are targeted for crypto mining takeovers. This happened to Tesla. I've talked about in the class that I built with Udacity as one of the case studies that we go deep on. They had their API server layer exposed. That, that actor took over their uh, one, one, or, one or many of their, their Kubernetes clusters and started spinning up um, Monero crypto mining pods to do crypto mining. Why? It's free compute. Well, awesome, right? How do you catch that as a big company with a, with a, lot, with a lot of infrastructure going on? I, unless you have logs that specifically look for like callbacks to their C2 control or uh, other, other um, uh, log level observability on like the network layer, let's say, you won't catch it uh, at the pod level unless you have pod level observability with something like Defense or, or, or Falco. You just won't. There's no, I don't think there's a way you can, you can technically do it. So to me, this is so definitely more advanced, but to me, if you, if you care about runtime and you actually care what's happening while the infrastructure is running before it gets, you know, killed, destroyed and reintroduced, because in this context, we mostly treat this infrastructure like like cattle, right, versus like pets. Um, we need the runtime observability, just like in the corp context. If we have a laptop on the network, I need the observability on the laptop because without observability, I can't re react to a, a a malware download on a laptop on 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 the corporate network. Just in the same way, I can't respond to an event on a pod in the cloud context unless I have, I have that low level observability. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So while it is essential to do scan as part of pre-deployment, of course, scan your cloud infrastructure, you know, using agent-based or agent -based solution to cover the basics, essentially, CSPM, vulnerability management, all of that. It is equally important to have runtime defenses, essentially, which, which use eBPF or one of, you know, something similar, essentially, to get you this low-level telemetry and really build detection on top of that, really, right? That's that's the high-order bit I'm taking over here, Nick. You need both. Uh, scanning comes first, sure. Uh, it's 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 that's a day zero need, but once you have that, you need something something which goes deeper, right? And you know, sort of you know, is looking at all of these all of these runtime signals to to say whether you are under attack or not. That's spot on. Like th this is not a a a the uh, start with this kind of thing. This is a uh, graduate from pre deployment to post deployment observability. But once you've graduated, this is the next step. Yeah. Perfect. Moving on, Nick, uh, and I have at least four more questions. I'm not sure whether we have time to take all of those, but at least with two of those questions we'll take. And this is probably the last question from my side. Uh, and, and you know, <laughs> a high-level one. Now, you've been you've been at 
multiple organizations, including SpaceX, and you know now at Snap, you know, you've 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 been a hacker since your childhood, almost from 16 years of age. What would be one piece of advice you would want to sort of leave our audience with, essentially, before we you know pause the session and then sort of open it for yeah. questions? Yeah. yeah. I think what's made the difference, Sandeep, is this philosophy of being a lifelong student. Being intellectually curious and really never stop learning. So if you stop learning, you will probably stop earning and or you may stop earning as much. Right. Yeah. This industry is extremely dynamic and fast paced and yeah. you should never you should never stop learning. So for me, the, the day I stop learning is probably the day the day I like fully retire and like just rest somewhere, not not focusing on this industry as much until then I will always continue learning. But learning is not enough to me. Um, to me, you need to teach others once you've gotten to a certain place in life to help evangelize and build up the next generation, right? The people we're hiring now are going to be me in some in, in some in some time frame, right? Right. There's also this philosophy that I take of always be firing yourself, like not actually firing myself, but removing yourself from the critical path to allow people who you've hired to become better than you. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, to me, the, to me, this is this this is this is the style of servant leadership that I that I that I like to uh, practice and r really support my team with. So, uh, and solve for the boring things first. The things that we talked about: the the hardening, the observability, the monitoring, the learning. Those are kind of boring. This isn't the ML. This AI that right. This isn't the stuff the vendors want to sell you. Like the boring stuff matters a lot, right? right? If you solve for the boring stuff, then you then you'll be in a really really good place, right? A lot of people don't solve for the boring stuff; they 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 jump into the sexy shiny object stuff, and they actually miss the point of of, the, of sort of of how to approach this in a kind of in a strategic uh, way in terms of security program uh, leadership. So, uh, I think the other thing is like have advocacy, have people that are supporters of your of you, and have people that you support. In the industry like this kind of relationship i think has really helped me like have a broader perspective on how the industry operates and pay it forward like give back speak to others whether it's at a meetup in your local you know community a, a blog that you write if you want to get you know very ambitious you can do a book or or teach yeah. it it's out there like the industry will allow you to do it you just you need to step up and 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 and, and be a participant absolutely Nick. love that uh, paid forward, absolutely, exactly what we believe at defense. I think with that, you know, what we'll do is we'll just open up for some more questions. Uh, I have a bunch of them in front of me, uh, but we'll probably just take two more, uh, given the, the time limit. So let me go ahead. This is a question for you, Nick, from Dave. The question is, when do you decide to pick up open source point solutions for a specific use case versus go with a broader platform, which is also open source. So what is the thought process behind taking up a single tool to solve a single narrow problem versus going broader yeah. in open source? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Dave. Thank, thank you for asking it. I think you need to start with your strategy. So we're, we're a doc-based culture. We write down, okay, problem statement, foobar, foobar at plus n, right? We write it down. We ask ourselves, okay, what are we trying to solve for? specifically, like very specifically, not high level specifically. And then we say, okay, how can we accomplish this? Okay, are we looking to scan uh, images? Well, we can do that with gripe, okay? Are we looking to look at a, a, a bill of materials? There's products for that. Open source products, free, come take it. Or are we looking for a solution that wraps them together like, like defense does, again, open source? Or maybe are we looking for commercial offering because we really want that. We really think like, this is the one. There are those as well that we've, we've, we've purchased. Like there are, this is the one kind of commercial solutions that are fully closed source that we've also bought. You gotta start with the strategy. You gotta ask yourself like, what are you solving for? What are the requirements? And, and, how, do you, and, and how will you get there? Absolutely. In fact, that was my uh, next question that was in front of you, Nick, that is, what are the set of criteria that you look for when you want to upgrade from open source to enterprise version of the product. Like, but uh, maybe that could be the sort of, you know, your concluding yeah. remark on that. That helps the founders like me yeah. and uh, companies who are, you know, trying to monetize open source. Yeah. Right. I, I know that's a really good question. You, you have to figure out what the market's going to pay for and what is 
what is desirable enough for a person like me or another security leader to pay for the enterprise? What does the enterprise need? Well, the enterprise needs usually like lower level authorization and account management because they have a lot of users using the system. We probably need additional logs. We may need support because we get stuck and we may not have you know all the resources to go iterate and like spin our wheels trying to figure it out through the forums. Um, we may need uh, more advanced features. You have to figure out what that is, depending on whatever product area you're in. Like in this product area, you know, Threat Mapper gives you observability. Threat Mapper gives you uh, context. Threat Mapper can ha have have you um, harden and ensure that what you're deploying into production is 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 safe. Now, Threat Striker, which is the 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 the, the enterprise product version here in this context. It will give you a threat graph. It'll allow you to seal off and stop attacks at runtime by, by basically killing the network con connection. Sandeep, you've studied this and you've decided, okay, th this is the thing people are gonna pay for. This is the thing that we're, we're gonna basically allow for free. You gotta yeah. do that for every product that's built. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The, the, what is day zero use cases? What are the day one use cases? Where is your IP as a company? You know, which, what, is, what is something that you can you know, give away, build a community around? You know, stuff like that. I think these decisions have to be made by, you know, on case by case basis by the, the companies that are trying to monetize. Uh, whether you want to go open core, you want to remain completely open source, or you want to, you know, have a combination thereof. Totally agree, Nick. Uh, this was awesome, Nick. Thank you so much for your time.